All right, good evening. We are ready to get started. So welcome back, week three. We are moving on. We spent two weeks looking at the holiness of God and how that is going to lay the foundation for us as we, as we continue to just look at the gospel from, from so many different facets to understand the character of God. That's our, that's our aim. Uh, goal for these next several weeks is just to know the heart of God, to understand his character, uh, and, and just how that transforms even our, our walk with him on a, on a daily basis. So we're going to keep moving forward tonight. We're going to spend two weeks looking at uh, what we call the doctrine of justification. And so before we jump into that, though, let's pray and, and we'll get started, okay? Heavenly Father, we pause tonight uh, very thankful for, for this opportunity we have to just dig into your word. Uh, Father, your word is alive. Uh, God, it, it, it is transformative. Uh, it is truth. It is absolute truth. Uh, it is our guide for life. It is how we can understand you. It is how you reveal yourself to us. And so tonight as we open it up, I pray uh, that your Holy Spirit, would just use it to illuminate our hearts and our minds. Uh, but God, also that as we, as we think that you, we would allow your spirit tonight uh, to just show us areas of our life that where we need to think differently, where we need to act differently, where we need to, to understand things in, in a better way. Uh, but God, most of all, I pray that even our study tonight would just draw us closer uh, into fellowship with you and intimacy with you, God, that just is so apparent to everyone who sees us uh, that they would know uh, that we belong to you and that we follow you, King Jesus. So tonight as we study, would you guide us in Jesus' name? Amen. All right, so justification. We are gonna jump in here for a couple of weeks. I, I promise to try not to have this feel like um, a systematic theology class to where you, I see you start nodding off, okay? We're going to try to keep it... Uh, after dinner, it's late, it's past some of y'all's bedtime. That's right. And we are now digging into like deep theological waters here, talking about justification. Uh, so we're going to try to keep it moving, keep you on your toes so you stay awake here. Um we're going to start with some church history. I said I was going to keep you awake, and then I said church history. That seems like a, that does not seem to go together, but that's okay. Church history can be fun. Uh, nobody agrees with me. All right. That's all right. Um, Gary's not here. Gary's not here to agree with me. I need it. Matt, will you give me an amen? Church history can be fun. No, Matt's like, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But Martin Luther, uh, if you, even if you don't know much about church history, you, know, you probably know this name. In fact, uh, tonight in Recharge, we sang a song that Martin Luther wrote. A Mighty Fortress is Our God is a hymn written by Martin Luther. Uh, lived in the mid four, late 1400s, early 1500s, came from a family, just a lower middle class family, but they had made something of themselves and they send uh, Martin Luther to school. And he has aspirations to be a lawyer, to even better himself even more. Uh, but God had other plans, and God is really working in Martin Luther's heart, and he writes about that and talks about how he's under constant conviction, uh, scared, just in fear of a holy God. And, um, and along the way, he ends up, through a series of events, in, in, a, in a monastery. He ends up in seminary studying the Word of God. He's left uh, his aspirations to be a lawyer, and now he's serving as a as a pastor in in his little German town, and he's also in school and he's teaching the Bible in this monastery. And as he's doing that, one of the things he's teaching his students is through the Book of Romans. Romans and Galatians were two of the books he was teaching his students through, and he gets into Romans chapter one. So if you got your Bible, open it up to Romans chapter one. He is known as saying what you see up on the screen here, that justification is the article by which the church stands and falls. 
And that came about as a result of reading Romans chapter one. And he gets to verses 16 and 17, which we're familiar with when we study the book of Romans. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God uh, for salvation. Um, And then he goes on to say in verse 17, for it is the righteousness of God in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And as Martin Luther is studying this, he reads it in Latin, in his Latin Bible, but now because of the, the Renaissance, because of this desire now to go back and study original languages, he now has a Greek New Testament. And so he reads it in Greek and he sees a couple of different words here for the righteousness of Uh, that we are made righteous here. Verse 17, where he says, the righteous shall live by faith. And he's like, what does this mean? And so he starts to study it. And when he comes to an understanding of what this means, he then, like his whole trajectory is changed. His whole preaching, his his whole goal in life, everything about him changes. And we're gonna see that in a few minutes. But I wanna ask you, Um, to take a few minutes before we really jump in around your table, or if you're at a table with just one other person, maybe uh, ask if you can join up with another table, because here's what I want you to do. There are two words, uh, the Latin word that Luther was reading for uh, the righteous shall live by faith was this Latin word, justificare, which means to make righteous. But then he gets out of his Greek New Testament and he sees this other words, dikaiosune, and this one means declare righteous. And he's looking at these two words and he's saying, which is it? Are they the same? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to pretend you're Luther in a German monastery and you're, you're, you're meditating on these things. And I want you to discuss for a few minutes, what is the difference between make righteous and declare righteous. I'm gonna give you about five minutes just to kind of brainstorm around your table and then we'll jump back in. So five minutes, go. All right. I hear a lot of scholars out there and theologians debating. A lot of Latin and Greek being spoken out there. I know. We got some Latin scholars, some Greek scholars here. Luther would be proud in this moment right here. He could he could join us from 500 years ago. So here's, here's the thing. Um, hopefully you had some good discussion and you begin to think through these words. They can be very similar depending upon how you use it, but let me give you some context here. In Luther's day in the Catholic church, here was the basic teaching. You come to God, you come to Christ in faith, but you stay in Christ by your works, okay? That's the general, uh, we could dig into all of that, but you stay through the keeping of the sacraments. And so when they would come to Romans 1.17, where it says the righteous shall live by faith, the understanding was your works of righteousness are what are going to make you stay in right relationship with a holy God. So it was making you righteous. But as Luther reads this, he sees in the Greek, it is, no, it is a declaration of righteousness. God is declaring you to be something. It is not something that you work toward. And so in here, his, his next statement here. Well, uh, but but real quick, let me, let me pause there. Uh, so it took... Uh, someone with the personality of Luther uh, to to spark the uh, this uh, the Protestant Reformation um, because Luther was a a very very bold strong personality and so wh- when you go through the Catholic system of making yourself righteous and all the sacraments uh, Luther was the type who who uh, very much uh, pressed by the holiness of God and wanted to keep every letter of the law, okay? He, he would wear his fellow uh, 
uh, monks out in the confession booth. He would confess for hours. And it's been told he would confess for hours and then he would he would leave, he would walk halfway down the hall, stop, remember something else, and turn and come back. Okay. It it was to the point because he wanted to he wanted to keep the system because God is holy, that uh eventually he was getting answers from his uh, from his fellow seminarians and monks of like, Luther, you got to chill out on this stuff. Like, like no one's expecting you to, to do all of this. Um, so, so when you talk about making yourself righteous, this, this is why Luther studied it and dug deep, deep into it because he, he tried to accomplish what the system that was set up. And, and, and the story continues, Luther's own like autobiography, he says the more he tried, the more condemned he felt. For every good thing he tried to do, for every confession, there's stories of him like climbing the stairs, the stone stairs up to the, the church, uh, and he would stop on every stair and just lay himself out uh, flat on the ground and pray and cry out to God for mercy. And then he'd stand up and go one more stair and do the same thing up. And every time it was like more conviction, more conviction that God was angry with him and that he was guilty. Uh, so he could do nothing to uh, to alleviate this this feeling of guilt as he thought about the holiness and the righteousness of God and and he was and he was getting to the place of just despair that yeah. he could never make himself righteous. So I I want to pause right there and tell you guys a quick story. When I was in college, uh, I was witnessing to a, a classmate and he was he was a Muslim and. Um, uh, we, we had coffee and lots of conversations. And, it, and at one point, he, he pressed me, and here was his press. He said, you Christians, you, you just believe that because of Jesus, all your sins just get forgiven, and um, you don't really have a holy God like us Muslims because we, we keep all these laws and all these rules. And, and I, I thought about that for, for a long time, right? I was young in my faith and thinking through, I thought that was, that was a good press. Like, so what is, what is that real answer? Do you guys know what the real answer is? When you, when you really come to the end of it, it's where we are here. It's that only the Christian God is holy. Only the Christian God is holy. And the reason is, is because when Luther is going through his system here, right, and he's trying to accomplish his own holiness and his own righteousness such that God would be pleased, the real answer is he never gets anywhere. He never even gets close. I like to use the illustration uh, of trying to long jump the, uh, 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 the Grand Canyon, okay? You may brag, and I could say to Daniel, I can long jump further than you, right? I'm certain I could. Uh, Right, and you compare yourself to someone else, and you're like, "I'm more holy than you." Yeah, but the reality is, the Grand Canyon's a mile wide, so it doesn't matter that I can long jump 15 feet and he can long jump 11 feet. Whatever, 16. who cares? Oh, 16. <laughs> so the reality is, and, and this is why Luther is such a good picture of this, right? Because he tried in all of his effort, in all of his effort, to accomplish the holiness of God, and it's so futile. See. Only the Christian actually has, uh, only the Christian upholds the holiness of God, the standard of God, because the Christian alone is the one who says, well, I can't do it. The only one who could do it is the Son of God himself, and he did it in my stead. Yeah. See that? So as he, yes, and so as he reads and he sees like, uh, this this phrase, the righteous shall live by faith. He realizes that this righteousness is not his own righteousness. It's not him making himself righteous. He goes, it is, he goes, whoa, you mean the righteousness by which I will be saved is not mine. And so he kind of coins these two phrases. He goes, he called it an alien righteousness or a righteousness that is outside of us. 
And when he saw that, and he saw that in Scripture, in the Greek, in his Greek New Testament, he says, when I discovered that, that it is a righteousness, not my own, that makes me right before God, he goes, I was born again of the Holy Ghost. And the doors of paradise swung open, and I walked through. I can... I, I never went to confession, you know, 20 times a day like a Luther or those things, but I can tell you as a middle school boy, like I can remember this as clear as I'm sitting here right now looking at you. The church that we went to when I was a boy was incredibly legalistic. Uh, there was this idea that was, it was implied and it was also just, just said right out of there is a list of rules that you must keep for God to be happy with you. Uh, and so I lived in this constant fear that if I missed one of those, then I must not be saved. I didn't think I was saved, and you know, and then if I and if I missed one, uh oh, I might lose it. No, I thought if I just didn't keep one of those things, that it must mean I never really got saved. So I remember as a middle school boy, almost every day, getting down by my bed and praying. God, if I really am not saved, would you save me right now? And then I would get up and feel better for a few minutes. And then the next, and then, you know, I have a lot of younger siblings. And so there were lots of opportunities to sin, you know? And so there were plenty of times something else would happen and it would be right back in that place. So like when I read Luther's words here, it's like, yes, when I finally understood how we are made right by, with God, it was like the doors were opened up. It was like a new birth when I finally understood the truth of Scripture. So Luther's, like, I love Luther, and I, and I resonate, like, because I kind of feel like at times, like, I get that feeling of just, just overwhelmed by the holiness of God, fearing that, you know, I will never be able to earn his acceptance, and then realizing where it comes from, it is like, this breath of fresh air. And so I hope tonight as we go through this and even next week, that even a, a clearer understanding of what it means to be righteous, to be justified, uh, will be incredibly helpful for you uh, as, as, it was, as it was for Luther. And so which word do you think is more accurate? Just shout it out. Make righteous, as in you've got to make yourself, or is justification about God declaring us to be righteous? Which, all right, good, good job. All right, so. All right, so here's what we want to spend a little bit of time doing tonight is looking through, just understanding justification uh, and just some of the, the principles, truths, things we need to know that will help us understand uh, what it what this word means and what it means for us to be justified. And the first thing we've got to look at and revisit is because we talked about this a good bit for the last two weeks, the holiness of God, that when, to understand justification, that's why we started with holiness, is because we must understand that God is the absolute standard for righteousness. He is righteousness. Psalm 119 uh, verse 137 says, it declares, God, you righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. So scripture just declares that God is righteous. Scripture also shows the righteousness of God. We talked about this a little bit uh, two weeks ago, but think about how it's expressed in the law. Um, in the Ten Commandments, uh, we see those written here. I've got the reference for you in Deuteronomy chapter five, but it's think through the Ten Commandments. And this, this standard that God gives his people in this covenant relationship with himself, it is this, this picture of, it's this message. God is setting the standard of what it means to be righteous before him. He tells his people, hey, I want you also in, in the Shema, in Deuteronomy chapter six, verses one through nine, right? He says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. He goes, and you must, like these things that I've told you, they must, you must keep them on the forefront of your mind. You must teach them and practice them. Think about them as you walk along the way. What was the idea? That they were keeping in front of them that God has set this standard for what it means uh, of what righteousness is. Matthew, 
the rich young ruler. You've got a, the passage there where he asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what did Jesus tell him? He says, you know the law, right? Do this, do this, do this. And what does the rich young ruler say? I've done it. I've done it all, right? And so what does Jesus then do? He says, well, then, then okay, so let's talk about something else. Go sell everything you've got and give it away. And now come follow me and you'll be righteous. And he walks away. Um, he's pressed by the Pharisees. What is the greatest commandment? What does he say? Love the Lord your God, right? He goes, he quotes, you know, Deuteronomy um, uh, chapter six. And then, he, and then he says, but then there's a second command. He talks about the 10 commandments, talks about the Shema. He goes, but the second one, most important, it's like it, it, love your neighbor as yourself. So he talks about this, this idea that it's the standard. God is the standard for holiness. He sets the standard for, for love. He is the absolute standard. We see it in the life of Christ. Um, when Jesus says, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He tells Thomas when he says, you know, or Philip, Lord, where are you going? And, and, how, and how could we know the way? He goes, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the way. Um, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is our high priest who was tempted in every way that we are tempted, yet without sin. He is that absolute standard, and that must be understood if we're gonna correctly understand justification, is that God is absolutely perfect, holy, righteous, altogether. There is no sin in him. But, Pastor, let's think through this one. There's another thing we must understand, and it is something about humanity. And it is that we are guilty, we're condemned, and we're helpless. You aware? Like, do you resonate with that? I mean, do you, do you know how helpless you are at living up to that absolute standard of holiness that God requires? Does scripture speak to it? Yeah, it absolutely does. Psalm 53. It says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And it goes on in verse three and says that there is no one righteous. Right? That is, that is the human condition. We are guilty. We're condemned. We're helpless. Isaiah talks about even if we try, if we try to bring our righteous deeds before God, thinking that somehow that is going to make us righteous. What does Isaiah call those? Thank you. Filthy rags. It is a... Um, the word there for filthy rags. It's not just like, you know, the rags that were used to wipe all these tables after you guys got through eating tonight, you know, made a mess on all the tables, like the rags are filthy. That's not the filthiness. These are, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and be, be graphic with it. The, the word is for menstrual rags. It would have been the rags that a woman would have set on during her time of the month those rags that would have been burned after that time. That is the language that Isaiah uses when it says, when we try to bring our good deeds to God, somehow thinking that will make us righteous, he says it is, it is filthy rags that we, that we bring before him. Um, the bad news, Romans chapter three gives us the bad news and the good news all at once. And it is that we are all accountable before a holy God. As, as those who have been made in his image, uh, we are accountable to him. And the account that we, that we bring is that we, we have sinned. Um, we didn't cover this last week because we didn't have time, but when you think about some of the interactions, even that Jesus had in the New Testament with, I'm thinking specifically with Peter uh, and some of his other, other disciples. You know, in the Old Testament, we talked about how you see the wrath of God and the holiness of God on, on display, and there's great fear. But you think, oh, but when we get to the New Testament and it's Jesus, 
he's just all about love and everybody's so, you know, just comfortable uh, around Jesus and that holiness thing is just kind of minimized. You know, but in Luke chapter five, when Jesus has been in the boat with Peter and Peter has witnessed this miracle that Jesus has performed of, of the fish, what is Peter's response when he comes face to face with the power and, and holiness of God? What does he say? He says, depart from me, Lord, because I am a sinful man. Uh, when Peter and James and John are on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? What is their first response, right? When they see the glory of, of, of the Son of God, they're afraid, right? That they fall face down, they're afraid, you know, because there is a holiness about God and the holiness of God shows us our sinfulness. Um, the psalmist cries out in Psalm 130, if the Lord kept a record of sin, who could stand? So there is this sense that, that Luther was feeling when he thought about the holiness of God. It was a right response for him to understand his guilt and condemnation and absolute helplessness to do anything to correct the problem. Yeah, the scripture says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And that's along the lines of what we're talking about, to, to, to genuinely uh, view God rightly is, uh, is to fear him because he is holy and we are not. And that's the beginning of wisdom. That's, that's the starting point for, is that me? I don't know who that is. Sometimes it gets caught in my beard. Uh, that's the starting point for, uh, for us to move towards uh, the good news. Um, you can't have the good news unless you begin with the genuine bad news. Uh, you can't be saved unless you know you're lost. Yeah. Jesus came to save sinners. So it begins with the truth that you are a sinner. And that oftentimes takes some, some difficult conversations. Uh, we don't like to view ourselves uh, as sinners in our culture. Uh, we certainly don't like to view, uh, we don't like to view ourselves as sinners. We like to view uh, ourselves that, that the truth is inside of us. Yeah. We're the ones who get to define truth. You should, you should live your truth. You should do those certain things. We, we really watered down so many things. Uh, but the reality is, is uh, I love the picture of God's holiness in Isaiah 6. You guys remember the, the vision of Isaiah 6? Isaiah 6, uh, Isaiah sees God in his throne room. Um, and uh, all of those pictures of, of God, those theophanies, uh, all you ever get is the description around God, okay? Uh, you never get God's face. You just get, and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory, and seraphim flew beside him, and they had six wings, and they did not cease to cry out day or night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And when Isaiah saw that scene, as he sees it, as he experiences, as he is in the midst of it, what is his response? Woe is me. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. Yeah. So that is the beginning of the gospel. Yeah, and, and I don't want us to move too quickly from it. That is the tendency. It's like, let's get through the holiness and the, the part that kind of strikes a, a sense of fear in us. Uh, about <laughs> who God is and, and who we are as sinners. Let's get on past that and think about the good stuff. But church, here's the thing. One of the things that is creeping into churches every day is this idea that, well, let's, let's minimize that because man is basically good, right? If you would just you know put him in the right environment, uh, he'll make good choices. He'll do good things, 
right? And, and we want to we want to focus on on that and minimize what what we see here that no, to really understand the gospel, it is right for us and it's it's and we will see it is actually the thing that honestly sets us free <laughs> to embrace the truth of the gospel for our everyday lives is to go ahead and just admit, right? And just just own it that we are, we are not basically good. We are dead. We are spiritually dead because we are sinners. Man is not good in and of themselves. We, we, we are sinners. And so this, this has to be foundation. Uh, and, and the way that it's, it's exposed so well is when we meditate on, on just the magnificence of who, of God, of his character, of his attributes. Uh, like all we have to do is think about those things to like, for like Isaiah to see ourselves in, uh, <laughs> in a clear, in a clear way to understand just how fall far short we fall. Um, yeah, that's a work of the Lord. You, you can't, uh, even if you're talking to someone, uh, y- y- you need to have faith in the fact that it's it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict people of sin, right? I'm not saying go out and just start pounding someone <laughs> with uh, you're a dirty, rotten sinner. Uh, but the reality is, is like that's that's a work of the Holy Spirit to see the holiness of God. His righteousness, that, that is a gift of the Holy Spirit um, because, because then it leads to salvation. Amen. So with seeing these two things, that God is the absolute standard and because of our sin, right, there is no hope of us living up to that standard to be righteous, to make ourselves righteous. We are helpless it leads to the next thing that we, we need to feel the tension of those things and see the dilemma that is before us, which is how can a person then be right with God? If God is this absolute standard of holiness and we are absolutely not, then how is it possible for God to do what Luther saw in Romans 1.17, that we can be declared righteous by a holy God? How can he just call us something that we are not? Some of the scriptures that you've got there in front of you, Job asks that question uh, when he says, can man be more righteous than God? In chapter four and in chapter nine, he goes, how can mortals prove innocence before God? Like, how can that be so? Proverbs talks about, can God, can a holy God acquit the wicked? And when you read these passages, you're left with seeing this, this dilemma, this tension here, because uh, the, uh, the writer of Proverbs says that to acquit the guilty is something that God detests. To call the guilty innocent is wicked, he says. He goes, in fact, in chapter 24, he says, anyone who says the guilty is innocent should be cursed. In Exodus chapter 23, verse seven, God says, I will not acquit the guilty. And in in Deuteronomy chapter 25 in verse one, God is giving directions to the nation of Israel and how they are to conduct their business and how, how they are to settle affairs and deal with things going on in the camp. And he says, acquit the innocent and condemn the guilty. So how does that how does that leave you feeling in that moment if you're just considering <laughs> this right here how can a holy god declare something that is unrighteous to be righteous wouldn't that be compromising who he is to say something that is sinful is not sinful and wouldn't that then in turn make him unholy to do so. But Jesus says it's possible for a sinner to be justified. In Luke chapter 18, he's talking about the Pharisee that enters in to pray and the tax collector that enters in to pray. And he goes through how they both approach God in prayer. 
And which one did he say? Which prayer does he say that God heard? The prayer of the tax collector who says, have mercy on me, God. I'm a sinner. Do you know what Jesus says about that? We don't see that sometimes. We think about the prayer and the, and the tax collector's cry to God, have mercy on me, O God, for I am a sinner. But what Jesus says is that man went home justified. He went home righteous. So Jesus says it is possible for a holy God to justify, to declare righteous a sinner. And then Paul talks about it in Romans chapter four, that it is God who justifies the ungodly. And I want us to spend a little time there for a few minutes. So if you've got your Bible, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter four for a few minutes. Because in chapter four, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a few minutes and I want you to read just to yourself. You don't even, I mean, you can just sit there and read quietly to yourself. Um, read chapter four, the whole thing. It is, it is 25 verses. I just want you to get familiar with what Paul is saying here in this chapter. And then we're gonna spend the little bit of time we have left here just looking at it and maybe one other passage. So read chapter four. So thank you for taking a minute to do that. Uh, there's a lot of words in there, right? And you may be thinking like, whoa, what, what all is going on here? Like we're talking about justification and now this, is, this whole chapter is talking about circumcision and, uh, and Abraham and, and the promise and, and all, of these, uh, all of these different things. But what is a word that you see repeated over and over again in chapter four? Faith. Faith. Yeah. Over and over again, we see the answer to the question here, right? When Paul says that God is the one who justifies the ungodly, which is what he says uh, in, in verse five, and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So, the, the answer here, the thing that we're going to dig in on <clears throat> for a little bit here, but also next week too, is this idea of how the faith, our faith in Christ is the means by which, right, holy God is able to declare righteous us who are unrighteous. So that's what we're going to see here. And what is the example <clears throat> that Paul that Paul gives. Who is the the character uh, from the Old Testament? Abraham. Abraham. And what does he say about Abraham? Okay. Was it was it the works? Right. Was it his? Was his? Was that work that what made him righteous? No. It was faith. Look at, look at the end of, um, look at verse nine. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. And then look at the end of the chapter. We could get caught up in the details of the chapter here as Paul is kind of building this case uh, for, for his readers here. But look at verse 23. But the, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but also for ours. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus from the dead, uh, from the dead, Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So, so Paul is making a connection here that like God says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, right? Right? Because Abraham lived 
prior to Christ coming, but prior to his incarnation, prior to his uh, sacrificial death, prior to his burial, prior to his resurrection, Abraham lived, right? But he is declared by God righteous. So it is, it is not anything to do with something Abraham did. It is just because of Abraham's faith in the promise, the promise of God. And he says, and for you and I, it is the same thing for us to stand before God declared righteous, not guilty. It's the same way. We come the same, the same way. Why is it not by works? Say that again, Sadie. How could you ever do enough? Yeah, what does he say the purpose of the law is here in this chapter? It's about halfway through. Yeah, the law shows us we're guilty, okay? Quick example, have you ever had a cop pull you over to say, I just want to tell you you're doing an outstanding job today? <laughs> keep, up the, keep up the good driving. Has that ever occurred to you? No. When does the cop pull you over? When you've broken the law. That's the purpose of the law. Right? It shows you you're guilty. Okay? And every one of us know we failed the law. Right? You know that. That's the purpose of it. And like Sadie said, what, what, can, what can you do to undo the bad that you've done? According to the law. If the cop pulls you over for speeding, okay, or you ran a stop sign, can you say to the cop, cop, I'm the best neighbor in the entire HOA. I keep my grass cut all the time. You should see my, my sidewalk's edge, really nice, got the best flower bed. Did, what does that have to do with anything? Nothing, right? But but I give to the to the PTA and and I serve on the on the council in the city. What does that have to do with anything? Nothing, right? Nothing. See, you, you see, there's no amount of good that you can do that undoes the fact that you've violated the law. What is the law's standard? If, if you're driving, how many times does the law expect you to stop at the stop sign? Every time. Can, can you plead, why well, stop here 90% of the time, officer? That's 9 out of 10. That's an A in school. What is the law's expectation? Perfection. Every time. The law's expectation is perfection. Right? And, and there's no amount of good you could do. Right? If, if you were caught stealing something or, heaven forbid, murdering someone, you can't go before the judge and go, yeah, but I pay my taxes on time. Okay, you still did this. All right, so if it's not by the law, why then, it, why then must it be by faith? In faith in what? Okay, faith in his love and mercy and grace, okay? 
So the reason it's by faith, your faith is in the object or the person of God himself, okay? Of God himself. God, you are a holy God, but God, you are also the kind of God who will provide and meet his own standard. That is the kind of God that you are. Abraham's faith is in God, in the God who makes promises, in the God who meets his own standard, okay? Even in the Old Testament, when there's foreshadows of the coming Messiah, there's a sacrificial system, there's those things that are pointing, ultimately, the faith is in God himself. It cannot be by the law, because who is the law putting trust in? Or trying to accomplish the law. It's putting trust in who? Ourselves, right? It's why we spend so much time comparing ourselves to everyone else. Like, I'm a better long jumper than Daniel. I don't care what he says. <laughs> we compare. We're like, I can do this better. That's why I've got to be good enough, right? And so the law is completely about putting trust in ourselves. So the reason it must be by faith is because it's putting trust in the object, in the person of God himself. God, the Holy One, is also the God who provides the standard. That's, and that's what we see accomplished through the work of Christ. That's where we're going, right? But the object is God is the one who's going to accomplish this, not me. That's why it can never be by the law. That's right. So I want you to, if you got your Bible, flip back to Romans chapter 3, and we're going to use this passage here in verses 21 through 26 to kind of review everything we've, we've talked about and kind of set the stage for where we're going next week as well. But I want you to kind of just follow along with me. You've got it there in your notes too, if you'd rather look there or it's up on the screen. I'm going to begin in verse 19. You don't have that on the screen, but you have it in your notes here. This is exactly what we were talking about. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So God's verdict of declaring us righteous Paul states it right there in, in verses 19 and 20. God's verdict that you are righteous cannot come through any human activity because the only thing we can offer is law breaking, breaking that standard. That's all we bring to the table. We are guilty. And so it can't be from there, but then look at verse 21. He starts to develop what he said in chapter 1, verse 17, when he says, you know, that the righteous uh, will live by faith. He says, but now look, now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. So he says there is something that we must consider that is different. But then he turns right around and says, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So he's saying two things here. He's saying there is something that God has done, this something new that will, that will allow holy God to justify sinners. He says, but make no mistake, everything in the Old Testament, the law and the prophets were pointing to this. So it's not new. It is God's plan from before the foundation of the world to do this thing that we're talking about. God justifying sinners. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus for all who believed, because there's no distinction. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So yes, the human condition, we are all sinners, but the good news of the gospel 
is that we all can be justified by this gift of his grace that he offers us through what? Verse 24, what is the thing that he justifies us by his grace as a gift through what? Redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God put forward as a, fun word, propitiation, very good, by his blood to be received by faith. What in the world does the word propitiation mean? It means to atone, okay? It has to do with payment. Any other? Take the place of. Satisfaction. God put forward his son, Jesus's work of redemption is the thing that satisfies the demands of a holy God. So I want you to think that this word propitiation was used uh, in all sorts of pagan religions too. So I want you to think, uh, you know, the kind of the stereotypical uh, before you would go on a on a sea voyage, or if if uh, right if the seas were roaring, the the pagans would say, "Well, well, the gods are mad, and we've done something to upset the gods. We need to appease the gods." Uh, or um, it, uh, the gods are mad. You know the whole scene of like there's an active volcano and we need to take a virgin and throw the virgin inside the active volcano. And the reason we're doing this is because the gods are mad and this will appease the anger of the god. We need to make the sacrifice to satisfy the wrath. That is this word propitiation. It means to satisfy the wrath of God. So with that in mind, keep reading. God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, the blood of Christ, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So Paul's saying like, let's look back. Let's look back and see how holy God who, whose wrath he had every right to pour his wrath out on sin, but there's time after time in the Old Testament where God stayed his hand of judgment and he showed mercy, amen? And so Paul is saying, look, he, he passed over these former sins. Why would he do that? Why would he show mercy when he was not obligated to show mercy because they had broken his holy standard? He says it was so that he could show his righteousness at this present time. What does that mean? Pouring the wrath, his wrath out on his son. That is how God showed his righteousness in, in this day. When he poured it out on, he poured his wrath out on his son. God's righteousness, his holiness, his wrath towards sin, that thing that would destroy his creation. He poured it out on his son so that we would see his righteousness, but at the same time, it was the thing that also allowed him to justify us. So in Christ, what we're gonna look at next week is we just unpack the, the beautiful picture of Christ's, Christ's work on the cross, his, his redemption that he purchased for us. We're going to see 
that it was in Christ's death that God justifies sinful people while he remains just. That's where that dilemma, that tension is resolved. It is in the work of Jesus that that, that, that takes place. Do you see that here in, in Romans chapter three? How Paul is just kind of building this Yeah, all of it builds to verse 26, where it says that God might be just, that is that God is holy in that he deals with sin. The the sacrifice was to show himself righteous. But then the second part, and the justifier, because he's the one who accomplished it. He's the one who sent his son. So the the two things that that we must always remember and understand about the cross is that in the cross of Christ, the holiness of God and the love of God meet. And the most beautiful picture of God's character on display for us to see and to find life in. The holiness of God and the love of God. And that comes from this verse right here, that he might be just and the justifier. Amen. So here's, here's something that would be just a, a devotional exercise, if you will, between now and next Wednesday. We spent three weeks now looking at the holiness of God uh, and now looking at this idea that holy God justifies us through the death of his son. Take a few minutes this week, even as you pray, just to write out a prayer of thanksgiving to God for how maybe in these three weeks he's shown you in a fresh way, like just what it means that he is holy, but also what it means that he has chosen to declare you righteous through the, through the work of his son and just how those things work. Just, just write down like what you would want to say to the Lord as you ponder and consider those things and how they, how they work for you to be able to stand like Luther, to say, <laughs> like, like the gates of paradise have been swung open because I am no longer standing condemned. I stand justified before God. Take some time just to praise him this week for that. Maybe even write it out as you thank him uh, for this incredible work uh, that he has done, that has been his plan, that was his plan, that he has accomplished. And then next week, we're gonna come back uh, and we're gonna look at that plan in just some more detail and just take our time to comb through some scriptures and see why it is so important that we have such an such a a firm grasp of this this doctrine, this teaching of scripture and how it's so central to the gospel. And that's how we'll wrap up next week, okay? All right, God bless you guys. Have a great night. We'll see you Sunday.